Good evening, everyone. Good to see you tonight. And um, I should have done that. Okay. Get our song or songbirds down here. Settle down. Stop chasing balls. We're going to be excited. We're going to have a good time tonight. Notice this week that they were talking about uh, a, a television ad a few years ago where a Yellow Pages ad where it talked about not happy Jan and somebody stole the, the theme of it and everything and they were fighting over it. But you know, that is the story of people. Is they're not happy. I'm not happy, Jan, not happy about this. Not happy about what's going on in life. Not happy about the country. Not happy about this person or that person. Not happy about the politics. Not happy about their situation. Not happy about anything. You know, their job, their sport. Of course, their team loses half the time. You say, how do you know they lose half the time? Because somebody wins and somebody loses. So that somebody loses half the time. All right? And somebody wins half the time. So never, you can't get people to be happy. You know, a little kid in Sunday school said, the teacher was saying, God can do anything. And he said, nope. What can't God do? God can't make everybody happy. You know what? And the question is tonight is, are you happy? Are you happy? What would make you happy? Uh, some new clothes? Uh, a new uh, a Ferrari? You know, wow, you know. Uh, you know, a trip to maybe London. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you get to go someplace or play some sport or, or do something. But, you know, people are constantly looking. A have you noticed that you can't hardly buy, afford to buy things, but they will throw things in your yard to tempt you? You notice you get these sheets? I call them lust sheets. How many get those in their yard? You get those lust sheets in your yard and you bring them in and you look through them and look at stuff that you never even knew existed, but now you want. Because you start lusting over these things. Oh, I got to have that and I got to have that. And pretty soon, the world is geared and advertising is geared around making you discontent. It's trying to get you to want what you don't have. One man says, Beardo, want what you don't have, then to have what you don't want, be careful what you ask for, you might get it. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think, oh, if I just had this, and then when they get it, you know, I have a friend in New York, a pastor friend, and I remember when he first started out, he lives right on the shores of Lake Ontario, or Rochester, New York, is right across from Toronto, and, and he got himself a boat, you know, he got himself a boat. He was so excited. And, you know, and he could go out fishing on that day off on Mondays when he took off as a pastor. He went out fishing. Now, you got to remember, Rochester, New York, in January, is about 20 below zero. And the snow is this deep. Let me assure you, he did not go fishing in January. So he could use this boat maybe six months out of the year. And one day a week, so let me see, Fast Calculations tells me that's about, at best, maybe 26 days. Now, I guarantee you, probably half those days. So now he has this new boat that he can maybe use half of the time. So that means he has 13 days a year that he gets to use it. But guess what? He gets the boat, and he has it for a year or so. And what do you think now he needs? We're going to need a bigger boat. So he buys a bigger boat. And he has that a couple years. And a little bit longer, Tom, you know what? He needs a, a bigger boat. And so he gets a bigger boat. And finally, he got a bigger boat. And then he decided that the, big, the biggest boat wouldn't make him happy. So he got rid of all his boats. But you know what? A lot of us are just like Tom. We think we need a bigger boat. We think we need more or bigger or fancier or better. And we're just not happy till we get it. We're always looking for something that will make us happy. 
We're looking to choose out of this world something that will bring us joy. We're looking for a new job. We're looking for a talent. Oh, I wish I could play football like him. I wish I could play on this team. I wish I could do this. I wish I could do that. If I could, I'd be happy. You know, a lot of people, a lot of young people, they say, oh, I wish I could sing like Beyonce. Yeah, and you'd be as unhappy as she is. You know, all these movie stars, you know, and and singers and everything, the one thing they have in common is almost all of them are unhappy. Yet everybody wants to be like them. Why, do you want to be just as unhappy as they are? It doesn't make sense, but we think it does. We think that that will make us happy. I want to help you tonight because I do want you to be happy. And if you'll listen tonight, I'll teach you how to be happy. Because happiness isn't found where you think it is. See, the problem is if you're looking for happiness, I'll guarantee the one thing is you won't find it. Because Many of you, most of you, some of you, not all of you, already have it. You already have the key to happiness. You know, have you ever looked for something, looked for something, looked for something, and finally you realized it was already in your hand? I was looking the other day. I can't remember what it was. That's why I'm just still looking, okay? But I can't remember what it was. But I was looking and looking and looking, and finally I realized I had it in my hand. You know, I tell you, you're really bad. But, you know, a lot of people are looking for happiness and it's already in their hand. It's already there. They already possess what they need. Nothing is as empty as a person who's constantly looking for happiness in all the wrong places. And many of you are like that today, especially you young people, because you're listening to the world tell you what will make you happy. You're listening to the world, and it says, get this, and you'll be happy. Get this, and you'll be happy. Go here, and you'll be happy. Have this person. Be, have this friend. Do this, do that. And the world is screaming at you to look at them and say, if you just had this, you'd be really, really happy. But let me tell you, look at the people who have it, and you'll find out their happiness. And if they are happy, they're happy for a fleeting moment. It's like they say, the, the, you know, the, happiest, the second happiest day in a, person, in a fisherman's life is when he gets his boat. The happiest day is when he sells it. You know, it, it's kind of getting rid of that. Is, that's the happy day. So happy, you're happy as long as you're looking at it. But you know what? Looking outward for happiness is a guarantee that you will never find it. Because happiness is not located over there. I'd ask you to take and... Turn in your Bible to the Song of Solomon this evening. Because in Song of Solomon, the first chapter, first verse, we see a man, or chapter 1 and verse 2, the second verse. Solomon, the richest man that ever lived. Now, if this guy had something, he had a lot of it. He had so many horses. He had so many chariots. He built houses that were so big you couldn't hardly walk around them. He, <laughs> and wives, <laughs> he had a couple of them, didn't he? He had how many wives? Too many. Too many to count. And then he had concubines. I tell you, you need, don't need concubines when you have that many wives. But he had them. He had them. He had them. He had gold. Uh, he had so much gold, they, they brought it in by the tr- truckload, but they didn't have trucks. So they, they brought it in a, lo- a lot at a time. And he had everything that the heart and the thing could desire, but he wasn't happy. And look what he says here in verse 2. He says, vanity of vanities. That means emptiness. It's just all empty. Empty, empty of emptiness. He says, saith the preacher. That's him. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh under uh, the sun? He says, uh, what is it? You you can work hard and you get all this stuff. And what profit is it? It's just nothing. It means nothing. And this is the richest man. Now, you say, I wonder what it would be like to be mega rich. 
you know, like Mr. Packer, you know what? He's so rich, he's selling everything because it's caused him so much heartache. It's not what you think it is. It's not the happiness that you think it is. There was a man, in fact, his nephew, somebody remember a guy that the Saudis took into their embassy in Turkey and killed him? Kasagi? Well, his uncle is a man by the name of Adnan Kasagi. Adnan Kasagi, in the 90s, was the richest man in the world. His uncle was the richest man in the world. He was an arms dealer. He sold guns and munitions to all these rebel nations. And somebody asked Adnan Kasagi, how much was enough? You know what he said? Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. You think, if I just had a bit more, if I had more of this, if I had another pair of fancy tennis shoes, I'd be happy. You know what? Those things do not make you happy. There was a rich man, though, in the Bible. And I think one of the richest men in the Bible is found in the New Testament. And his name was the Apostle Paul. Go over to Philippians, if you would, with me. Philippians, because here was the Apostle Paul. Now, this is a guy that had it figured out. Hey, if you want to find out, find out a guy who's happy. A guy who's rejoicing, who's in in the Lord. Watch watch somebody that has a heart that's really in good shape. Look at this. In verse 11 of chapter 4 of Philippians, it says, Not that I speak in respect of want, For I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Wow, he was content. You know what contentment is? It's inside sufficiency. That inside me, I don't need anything else. Paul was content. Now, you say, man, I wonder what kind of house he had. I wonder how well he was living. Uh, You know, man, he's famous. Almost everybody knows who the Apostle Paul was. If they knew about Jesus, they probably know about the Apostle Paul. He was famous in his day, wasn't he? You know where he was at at this time? He was in that city of cities, the city of Rome. He was in Rome. You know, I went to Rome. Got sick, didn't get to see anything, but I was at Rome. That's where Paul was. I bet he was having a good time. You think he was having a good time? He must have. He wrote this. He, you know what else he wrote? Look at the first verses of that chapter. He said, rejoice, or a few verses down, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He says, be happy. Be anxious for nothing. He was, he was just rejoicing. And he wrote all kinds of letters telling how happy he was and rejoicing in the Lord, how good God was. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He was, he was happy, wasn't he? You know where he was when he was writing this book? He was in a place called the Mamertine Prison. You mean he wasn't having a good time? Well, see, he was in this whole... Now, it wasn't far from the forum, the big Roman forum. But he was in a hole in the ground. See, their their jails weren't like ours, where there are country clubs with televisions and uh, three meals a day and everything. First of all, if you got food at all, your friends had to bring it to you. And he was chained between two guards, and he was in a hole in the ground where they would throw stuff down to him. And it was a hole, and they had a grate on the top. And it was not exactly, you know, the closest friends you had were rats. Those are the ones that came around and visited you regularly and everything. But, and not only is it, he's writing to the people in Philippi. Remember, he had a little trouble when he was there, to Remember uh, where he stayed in Philippi? You remember a story of the Philippian jailer? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's one thing. The government was always putting up him up wherever he went. You know, he was in good shape. You know, he had accommodation always provided for him. You just go to the local jail. You'll find the Apostle Paul living there. And he's saying, I'm rejoicing in the Lord. You know, Christ is my all in all. He was rejoicing in the Lord because he was happy. Now you say, but something doesn't match here. He's in a dirty, nasty, ugly prison. And yet he's happy. You notice he sailed on probably one of the most famous, beautiful 
places in the world. The Mediterranean Sea. The Aegean Sea around the Greek Isles, which is around Corinth, he sailed there. But you notice, you never find a travel dialogue in Paul's writings. He never talks about how beautiful. He, he was on a place called Mars Hill, wasn't he? Remember Mars Hill? What was next to him on Mars Hill? The Parthenon. But you don't see it written in the Bible, do you? But he was on Mars Hill. That would have been right next. Right. He could have seen it from there. Why? Because those were not the things that made it. You say, oh, I went to, saw West, went to London and saw Westminster Cathedral, and, and I went to Paris and saw the Eiffel Tower, and I went here and saw this, and I went and saw that. That's why, because he, he knew that didn't make you happy. You know what? I've seen those things. They don't make you happy. Oh, people say, oh, I want to go around the world so I can see this. Not going to make you happy. Not going to make you happy. Not going to make you rejoice in that. See, the problem is, is most people want to be happy, but they're looking in all the wrong places to find the happiness that they so desperately want in their life. They think, if I just had this, I would be happy. If I had this person, the girls are saying, if I just had this guy as my boyfriend, I'd be happy. No, you wouldn't. Just ask his last girlfriend. You know, she had him and find out how bad he was. You know, and you, the boys are saying, don't talk. Well, guys, you're looking for a girl. And, and, you know, and no, no, no. She's not going to make you happy either. But, hey, if you're not happy without them, you'll never be happy with them. You need to find your happiness someplace else. Another person is not the result of your happiness or your unhappiness. Your joy in life comes from internal sufficiency. And the only way you're going to be sufficient internally is to have Jesus Christ dwelling within. Christ is your all in all. Paul found in Jesus Christ his sufficiency. I mean, Paul was out there. I mean, he, before he, when he was Saul and he was out there beating the Christians and doing all this, he was trying to find his sufficiency and his satisfaction in being what he thought was right with God. But he didn't have it. Why? Because, let me tell you this. You know what? Preaching the gospel won't make you happy. Going out soul winning will not make you happy. Teaching a Sunday school class will not make you happy. Preparing the morning lunches for church will not make you happy. Don't think that doing those things will make you happy. Until you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and He is all you need, you know what? You can't sit in a prison and do nothing and say rejoice in the Lord always. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you don't walk with Him, He is what will make you happy. Not these things. Not the things that are around you to, will not drive you to happiness. Oh, folks, you think, I, if I just had something this. Um, mine happiness is not determined by my circumstances. Whether you're poor or rich, whether you're married or you're not married, whether you're healthy or whether you're sick, whether you're employed or unemployed, those don't matter to your happiness. Oh, they may matter with what you can buy and do these things, but folks, that's not happiness. That's happiness. Paul said, I've learned how to be abased and how to abound, how to be rich warm and how to be cold. He, he had all these different contrasting circumstances, but he said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be. Oh. See, because he didn't let all of his circumstances control his happiness. His happiness was not manipulated. See, you couldn't manipulate Paul. It didn't matter if he was stoned and thrown out of the city or if he was heralded as the great preacher. It didn't matter, because neither of those made him happy. His Savior and his relationship with God made him happy. How is that working for you? He said, my peace and my joy and my happiness is on the inside, and you can't take it from me. Go over to Proverbs chapter 23, if you would. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7. 
Hopefully you're getting this because if you'll get this, you can be happy tonight. You can be really happy tonight. You don't have to say, oh, it's just something. I wish I had this. I got to go to school tomorrow. I, even worse than that, I got to go to work tomorrow. See, work won't bother you if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ because you're already happy. And you'll go to work happy. You know, you can whistle while you work. You know, you can do one of those, what was that, Snow White or the guys that whistled while they worked or something. Yeah, you know what? They had something. Okay, Proverbs 23 and verse 7. So, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith uh, he to thee. But his heart is not with thee. Folks, it's your heart. That's where the happiness is. That's where the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's something that comes from within, not something that's going to come from without. Your thoughts uh, dictate your happiness. Go over to Philippians, back over to Philippians chapter 4. And let's go to verse 1. Verse 1 there, it says, Therefore, my brethren, uh, dearly beloved, and uh, long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, um, my dearly beloved. Here's a guy. Now, he's in a miserable, awful place. He says, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved. He said, you know, you're the brethren I love. Now, remember, he's here. He's sending Timothy and Epaphras back. Demas had forsaken him. He, but he was in love with the brethren. Why? Because of the love of Christ was dwelling in him richly. His relationship was right with God, so his relationship was right with man. He, he said, I don't need anything. Good grief, buddy. You're in a prison. You, you, don't you want to get out? Doesn't matter to me. <laughs> the Lord is as good here as he is outside. The Lord is my sufficiency. I got everything I need. I've got to walk with the Lord. Hey, it's nice when you bring things. I appreciate those things. He wasn't ungrateful, but he didn't need those to make him happy. He says, and long for my joy and crown. You know what was his joy? What did he just say? What was his joy and crown? The brethren. It was the Timothys and the Epaphrases and, and the people back at Philippi, those that were serving the Lord and being faithful. You know what the joy was? God says, you know what? I sent you there. I used you. You got stuck in jail a while. But you know, God won that jailer. He's still serving the Lord. Oh, he said, man, man, isn't that good? Isn't that good? When you hear about somebody many years later, you know what the joy in my life is, is that we're going to have some fellowship with Peter and Margaret Leslie. And their daughter is down in um, Canberra. She's a pastor's wife. Her husband is a guy that came from my youth group, just like these guys. He's about this younger than you guys. He was, I think, about 11 years old when I got there. And he, he came along and he got there. And his sister was a couple years older than him. His sister is a pastor's wife in America. He's there. He's serving the Lord. They're, they're down in Canberra. They're doing that. Their kids, some of them, going to serve the Lord. You know what? That's the joy. But it's because of what the Lord is. It's not out there. It's not the world. It's in the Lord. In Christ, the joy comes from knowing that. You know what? That was 40 years ago that I had a chance. There, his joy and his crown... They're, they're the joy of the Christian life. They're the joy. You know what would be the joy for every one of you young people? Is have one of your friends come along and trust the Lord. I got in touch with a guy that he was, uh, he was a heavyweight wrestler. We, wrestling's a big thing in America. They have wrestling. And he was our heavyweight wrestler. He, he was second in the state. He was really good. He went on to wrestle at the Air Force Academy, wrestled internationally and everything. But I took him along to an evangelistic service, and he got saved. And I actually got in touch with him a little while ago. I hadn't talked to him in many, many years. But you know, that's, that's the joy that introduced him to my Savior. 
That's the joy. The joy of the Christian life is when you have a relationship with the Lord and you can share it with others. Others are your joy, folks. That's what it's all about. Paul's happiness was not in that he, what he was, his situation, or what he had. Man, he didn't have much. But he left uh, those who had been, um, well, he had been forsaken by Demas. But that didn't bother him because he still had the Lord. The Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. A Demas may. You're going to have some people who are going to disappoint you in your life. But the thing is, the great comfort is, is if you're walking with the Lord, he doesn't. You know, other people are going to disappoint you. I will guarantee you that. Some people that you think are the greatest things since sliced bread are going to be the ones that hurt you the most. You're going to find that people of this world, they're sinners. But Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. He's the one. You can't control the outside, but you can control what's going on inside. Paul was content in this prison, a hole in the ground, and he was suffering, but he was content. You know what, you know what discontentment is? You know what disappointment is? Disappointment is an unfilled expectation. That's all disappointment is. Now, I can make these two boys, one be happy and one be disappointed. And I can do the same thing to both of them. I'll guarantee you. Who wants to be happy and who wants to be disappointed? <laughs> I knew I could. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. What's this? Okay. 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 I just checked how much money I had in my pocket. Okay. <laughs> See, already you're disappointed. You thought you were going to get that, didn't you? <laughs> All right. Now, okay. I'm going to give you $100. I'm going to give you $5. Watch this. If I give you 10, you're going to be happy, aren't you? Why? Because it's five bucks more than I promised you, right? If I give you 10, you're going to be happy? You're going to be disappointed, aren't you? Because you thought you were going to get 100. <laughs> See what it is? See what, disappoint See what disappointment is? It's not a matter of what you have. It's what you expect. It's unfulfilled expectations. He didn't expect to get five, but I got 10 here. He expected to get 100, and he's only getting going to get 10. <laughs> Ripped off. Ripped off. There you go. There's 10. Oh. <laughs> 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 and you can't go and ask him to pay your, buy you something, okay? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Expectation is your biggest enemy. If you don't expect much, you're going to be happy with what you get. The devil wants to tempt you. See, that's why he's throwing all those advertisements. That's why he's telling you all these things on TV. That's why he's telling you all these things. So you'll be disappointed. You'll disappoint. The devil is a joy killer. He's not trying to make you happy. He's trying to make you unhappy. What do you think the devil was here to make you happy? He's a liar. He's a con man. And he's a cheat and a thief. He'll steal from you the joy of your life if you believe him. But most of you are sitting around believing every lie he hands out, thinking that if I just, this just happened or this just happened, if I just had this, I'd be happy. No, you won't. You'll be as disappointed because that's his business. Hey, do you think Adam and Eve were happy when they believed his lie? Oh. He promised them that they would know the good and evil. Well, you know, the funny thing is they already knew good. All he gave them was to know evil. That's not really a good bargain, is it? That's not a good bargain. But see, the devil always is tricking you. He's always making you think, oh, you'll be as God. Hey, let me clue you in. You don't want to be like God. You don't want to be like these movie stars. You don't want to be like these sports heroes. 
Hey, you know, there's one up North Queensland. Yeah, he's beating up his girlfriend, all that. Oh, boy, what a great life. What a great life. They got all this stuff, and yet they go off. Some of these young tennis players, they got all this money, and they got fancy cars, and their life is a mess. Every, even the world thinks they're brats. Why? They don't have joy. They don't have anything happy in their life. Paul knew the secret to happiness was Jesus Christ. Go over to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. I think this is one of the key verses. You ought to memorize this verse. That I may know him. The first goal, the, the first hunger and desire. You want to have joy in your life? You want to be happy? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He said, and the fellowship of his suffering. Being made conformable into his death. You think, boy, that doesn't sound real good. Suffering and death and ooh. You know what? There was, you know what the greatest joy in our Savior's life was? The greatest joy in Jesus Christ's life was on a hill called Golgotha. Greater love hath no man than this than he lay down his life for his friend. I went to school with a man named Jim Young. Jim was a very talented musician. He played backup music for many of the big name country singers back in the 60s and 70s, long before the ones you know today. But he was singer, played tremendous guitar, and his wife also. He surrendered, came to Bible college, gave up that whole life, and came to Bible college. We came there, we got there in September, and he was serving the Lord. He had a little five-year-old boy. And that five-year-old boy, um, he was going on, and things were going really well about March that year, the next year, about six months later. He had been serving the Lord, and, you know, they were singing. We were in a group, uh, singers together and everything. And... um, One day, he came home and his five-year-old son said, Dad, he said, the Lord's really convicted me. He said, I haven't witnessed to our neighbor next door. He said, do you have a track? He said, I want to go tell him about Jesus. I tell you, (laughs) you talk about a dad getting happy. You know, I tell you, his heart rejoiced and the Lord was working in his young son's life. You know, he had made the right decision. He was doing that. A couple days later, he came home to an empty house. There was a note on the table. She says, I no longer want to be here. I've left with the kids. I think he had two children, if I remember right. His wife left him, ran off with some other guy up into West Virginia, some hillbilly. A few months later, he got to see his little boy. His little boy was cursing, using the language of the people he had been taken around, using bad language, and it just broke Jim. Jim went to a friend of ours that was a very godly lawyer. I know that's an oxymoron, but a godly lawyer, you know. And he went to Bill Sheehan, was his name, and he said, I know it says, and all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. He says, how can God get the glory out of this? And Bill Sheehan said one of the wisest things I've ever heard a man say. He said, Jim, I don't know how God is going to get the glory out of your situation. And some of you are in some tough situations right now. But he said... Jim, he said, almost 2,000 years ago, there was a group of men sitting on a hillside at the foot of three crosses. And I imagine that same question may have been answered. How can God get the glory out of this? How can God get the glory out of your life? Your situation will not determine your happiness. 
your relationship with your Heavenly Father and your Savior will. It's not going to be your circumstances that are going to determine whether you're happy or not. It's going to be determined by your inward sufficiency that Christ is, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. Christ is your all in all. Your relationship with him is what it's about. It's not about your circumstances. Are you following the Lord tonight? It is someone, not something. I am happy as long as Christ lives. And good news, he's eternal. He's eternal. I don't have to worry about losing my money. For I count all but loss for the sufficiency of Christ. Christ is our sufficiency. He met Christ. The question is, have you met him? You know how you can tell if you met him and you're walking with him? Because in whatsoever state you are, you're still content. Oh, you see, they're going through tough times, but just they have such a sweet spirit about it. I'll guarantee you that sweet spirit is because there's a Jesus Christ that they're trusting in. We all go through tough times. That's life. But I want you to be joyous tonight. And the way you're going to have joy is a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only way. Get alone. Get with him. And you will find he is the joy and strength of your life. He is your rock. Let's pray. Father, I pray you take your people tonight and give them the joy of the Lord. Because it will be their strength. They'll be able to look forward to the next day because Jesus is there. Lord, I pray you just help each one of us to abide in Christ, to walk in Christ. For you are our refuge and our strength, the very present help in time of need. You are what we need. You're what every person here needs. Lord, I want them to be happy tonight. Lord, the devil wants to steal it, but you want to give it. Will you let him, each one that's here tonight, have the joy that only you can give. In Jesus' name, amen.